Well, thank you, Brian, for those very, very kind words. I don't deserve them at all, and none of us deserve any kindness. It's only by the grace of God. Well, I want to begin this morning by making an important clarification, as Dr. Biedebach mentioned. This is a faculty lecture series, part of a faculty lecture series, so today will not be a sermon. Today will not even be a lermon, a lecture sermon. I know. I heard the groans. Thank you. I empathize. Uh, One of our board members is here, and earlier this morning I was meeting with him in a different meeting, and and I said, well, let's prepare to be bored. And he says, oh, I'm, I'm not coming to hear you. I'm coming to fellowship with everybody else. That's great. This is a pure lecture. This is a pure lecture because the topic assigned this morning to really get at it, to really properly understand it and establish it, it is going to require a pure lecture. And my heart in this, even though it is a lecture, will be to equip you for the rest of your ministry. In past, I have talked about the Christocentric hermeneutic, and I would refer you to the lecture I did on that as well as the articles that I've written on the subject that was primarily a critique. That was primarily showing some deficiencies in their approach to Scripture. This time I want to approach it from a different angle, which is a more positive angle of establishing not necessarily what not to do, but actually understanding what to do and to how to properly be what we would desire to be and how to have confidence in it all. And so in essence, the topic assigned to me at this time is a mix of really two things. One is Christ in the Old Testament, and the hermeneutical underpinnings will be second within that discussion. And again, this is academic. It requires a lecture, but nevertheless, like I just mentioned, nothing can be more ministerial and practical. Because while we critique the Christocentric hermeneutic, people, in thinking that, they allege, oh, dispensationalist people at the master's seminary do so because they do not believe in the centrality of Christ. That has been asserted against us, and nothing could be further from the truth. We believe that the Old Testament declares Christ from the beginning, from even the very first promise of Genesis 3.15. We believe that that is a messianic prophecy that determines redemptive history from beginning to end. We believe that the Messiah is the line of the seed culminating in him. We believe that Christ drives the storyline in his pre-incarnate appearances, say, as the angel of Yahweh or the word of Yahweh. We believe that the Old Testament declares him in direct prophecy, like in Numbers 24.17. We believe that the Davidic dynasty sets up for him and he is the fulfillment of that kingship and kingdom and it only comes in him. We believe that the Old Testament develops a theology, say, in the areas of atonement, salvation, forgiveness, righteousness, and kingdom that can only be culminated and claimed by the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that the Old Testament drives to the New Testament that in and of itself, the Old Testament is not fulfilled. That is not how it concludes and therefore it demands new revelation in the New Testament which is clinched around the Lord Jesus Christ. And along that lines, we believe in the New Testament with the gospels that Jesus is central in that. And within this, the cross, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord are essential. We believe that the Christ of scripture is the church's proclamation. We are called to be a witness of him. And in Acts, we extend him. And in the epistles, we believe that we understand the practice and theology that points to him, whether that be in our unity, whether that be in our purpose, whether whether that be in the gospel message, it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means all the way to the end, the book of Revelation, we believe there is only one who can finish the job. Revelation four and five, who is worthy to open the scroll? Well, it is the only one who has been worthy all along for he has driven everything in the plan of God from the beginning to the gospels, through Acts, through the epistles, to the book of Revelation. There is only one worthy and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is by the design of the Father forever and ever. Amen. That is what we believe. We are always Christ-centered in that regard. And we make no apology for that. We believe that there is no salvation apart from Christ. We believe that Israel will not receive her promises as originally articulated apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that there is no kingdom apart from Christ. And we believe that the fullness of that kingdom in all that is promised and articulated by scripture can only come about by Christ. All glory belongs to Christ 
and him alone. We proclaim him. He is central. He is glorious. He is honored. He is pivotal. From Old Testament to New Testament, that is the cry of scripture, and we believe that. No one can allege that just because we hold a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic, we do not believe in the centrality of Christ. That is incorrect and fallacious. We do affirm the centrality of Christ. In fact, the reason that we critique the Christocentric hermeneutic is not because we do not, pardon the double negative, believe in the centrality of Christ, but because we do. And we want to see him honored, not only in the end of our proclamation, but in the means of our study of him throughout scripture. We want to honor him in what he says and then honor him in declaring him properly and in his full glory as he unveils the full theology that is about himself and that surrounds himself in all of scripture. We are Christ-centered. That is why we are having this discussion. And that makes the second issue relevant. The first issue is Christ in the Old Testament, and we believe he is there. But what about the hermeneutical underpinnings? How is this a practical and pastoral matter? To be sure, we want to study and preach and teach accurately the word of God. That's a pastoral matter. We don't want to read him in. We want to see the full glory of what he has revealed. But at the same time, here is where the pastoral matter comes to full bear as you teach the Old Testament in your ministry, and you should. You may wonder sometimes as you read your Bible, does this connect with Christ? How does this connect with Christ? Does this connect with Christ at all? How do you know? You know Christ is central. You want to preach him to your congregations and you're studying Old Testament texts. How do you make all of that work and how do you make that work with confidence? It is easy in preaching lab, to pick one Old Testament text that you know no one will dispute you that it connects with Christ. That's easy. It's easy to cherry pick a text. It is much more difficult day in, day out, every single week to work through your Bible, to work through preaching a book of the Old Testament, and to discern How do I know this is about Christ or not? How does this relate to Christ? And in what fashion does it do so? And how can I be confident in those assertions before God? Because I know I have to stand accountable to him for what I say about his word. That's the pressing question in your study in ministry all the time. And in light of that, in light of the fact that there is nothing more glorious than preaching Christ, and in light of the fact that we want to make sure we do so in a way that honors Christ, particularly as we handle the Old Testament, my goal for this time is to equip us. It is to equip us with both not only the methodology to do that, but the entire framework of how we know, how we can stand before Christ with a clean conscience and say, we did our homework, we did what we were supposed to do, and these are the reasons why we believe that we haven't handled the word of God rightly, handled it in a way that has honored the Son of God My job is to equip us not only with the how-to to to do that, but also the framework of why that is valid. And that is my goal today. And in light of that, my heart behind it is to equip you so that when you open your Bible and when you are reading it and when you are studying it, you know how to study it. You know how things rightly connect with Christ And you can stand in the pulpit confidently knowing you have both honored Christ in the means of your study and the end of proclamation. Now, how am I going to do this? Well, one, there are three steps, three steps. This is where I'm Lerman-ish because we got three steps. They all are alliterated just to be helpful. One, we'll talk about the problem. Two, we'll talk about the prophets. And three, we'll talk about their messianic proclamation. Problem, prophets, proclamation. The other way we're going to do this is hopefully somewhat efficiently. As I was writing my thoughts down on these pieces of paper, 
I soon realized that I had enough pages that actually comprise an entire semester's worth of notes. And we have approximately half an hour, like Veggie Tales. So, <laughs> sweet and sour, half an hour, let's try this out. Let's first talk about the problem. The problem. This is a lecture. You can get away with that. <laughs> the problem. Here's the first point. Here's the problem. Some people think, oh, the problem is a hermeneutical problem. The problem and the issue is that, well, how do you discern whether you should have this hermeneutic or that hermeneutic? In actuality, the problem is that we think that's the problem. That's actually not true. It's not necessarily a hermeneutical problem at its core. It relates, to be sure, but it's actually a problem of bibliology. It's actually a problem of bibliology. It is a problem, really, with this entire discussion about the sufficiency of authorial intent. Whether you are reading Christ in or you are reading Christ out, the issue is about authorial intent. What comprises the true meaning of the scriptures? That's a bibliological issue that connects, of course, with a hermeneutical issue. They go hand in hand. For the Christocentric hermeneutic, and here I am doing a very, very large and significant oversimplification of the matter. Again, I would refer you to what has been written and discussed earlier. But with the Christocentric hermeneutic, they desire to situate Christ in every text. And the ground that they do so, whether they're talking about typology, whether they're talking about the meaning of scripture, whether they're talking about the ideas or the imagery or the symbolism or the themes or whatever it may be, it goes back to the nature of scripture. What they would always contend is that latent in the Old Testament, there was symbolism that pointed to Christ. It was hidden, but now it is revealed in the Christ event. It is revealed when Christ has come. He opened people's eyes to allow them to now reread the Old Testament with a new lens, a right lens, and unlock what was always there. Hence, the New Testament writers, that is seen in how they use the Old Testament. They supposedly, like in Hosea 11.1, 1, for example, have a Christocentric grid on Old Testament text. But I stress again that this is based upon the nature of Scripture in the Christocentric hermeneutics articulation. What is hidden, what was divinely hidden, there now is a fuller sense revealed, a fuller sense unveiled. And it is that fuller sense, that layer of divine meaning layered on top of authorial intent what was originally articulated that allows them to, in a sense, we would say, read Christ in, but they would say, from their perspective, see Christ fully as he was fully intended in the text. There is that additional layer. Now, while we have critiqued this method, and there are a lot of ways to do so, directly on their theological formation, also on the New Testament's use of the old, a major question, a major issue that can still be useful in the discussion and certainly pertinent to this discussion is how do we know what people are saying when they say Christ is here in this way, Christ is there in this way of the Old Testament? How do we know that's real? How do we know that that idea, that connection with Christ is truly legitimate, that that's God's meaning? After all, it was hidden. It was unrevealed in that sense. It was veiled previously. How do we know that that is there the way that Walter Kaiser or Daniel Block ask it is, how do we know where divine meaning is versus the creativity of the human reader? How do we know? It's real. You don't just want to make up God's word. After all, we are not authors. We are readers of scripture. So where does human ingenuity start to become authoring scripture? as opposed to being the reader of scripture that we are to be. And at this point, we say, yeah, they're not real. They're not showing us real meaning. And we kind of feel pretty smug and good. And we say, go literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutics. We go by what the text says and we'll be just fine. But then we start to hit some texts. 
And we start to open our Bibles and we start to study. And then you read Psalm 110 and people are saying, oh, this is just a coronation for Solomon. And then you read Psalm 22 and I kid you not, people say, and this is David being sick. He just had the stomach flu. On a side note, I've never heard anyone describe the stomach flu like Psalm 22. But in any case, people say these things. And then in Psalm 2, they just say, well, this is a generic coronation of a king. It's not really messianic. And all of a sudden, all these questions pop into our minds. How would they know about the Messiah? Why would they write about the Messiah? How could they know these details about the Messiah? Why would they think about the Messiah in these contexts? And as we ask these questions, all of a sudden, the questions compel us to feel like, well, it's pretty unlikely. It's pretty doubtful that they would be talking about Christ in these kinds of situations. And it makes more sense that they would be talking about something more immediate to their situation. And all of a sudden, at the risk of not reading him in, we are at the risk of reading him out. This becomes a problem. But the questions that are being asked, the questions that I just enumerated and listed, they are not benign. They are not neutral. They are actually indicative of presuppositions about Scripture, just like the Christocentric hermeneutic had presuppositions that there could be a layer of meaning behind, above, on top of authorial intent. There is a presupposition here about the nature of authorial intent, that it is less than what maybe the Bible suggests it could be. And those presuppositions of diminishing authorial intent and reducing it and constricting it and constraining it those presuppositions come from somewhere. They come from higher criticism. They come from higher criticism. Christocentric tries to layer on top of Scripture. Higher criticism tries to reduce down Scripture. Now, all of you, when I start talking about higher criticism, you will wish you stayed awake and paid attention in OTI and NTI. When you're in those classes, I know, I see you, and I've been there. You wonder, why are we even talking about these things? And what are you even talking about with all these letters, J-E-P-D, and then weird German people named Bauer and things like this? I know what's going on. I can tell. But all of that matters. It all matters. So if you haven't had OTI and NTI, please stay awake. This matters. This is important. Because what happens, and we need to see the full picture of what is happening, higher criticism is engaged, and this is what we're most familiar with, in essentially deconstructing the author, to use the modern terminology. They want to account for the Bible, as we well know, by removing its supernatural properties. And so they say things like, well, yeah, there's prophecy, but it happened after the fact, so it's not really prophecy. Oh, oh yeah, there, there, there's history here, but it's really chopped up into a bunch of sources and redacted together. And so there's really these hidden political agendas. Oh, oh there's, there's ideas of, of, of accuracy told in the scriptures that even happen archeologically, but that's just coincidence or that that's just a different agenda entirely. And, and most of the scriptures, they actually don't correspond to history and they don't need to correspond to history and things don't even match up with certain archeological records for that reason. We understand how higher criticism argues against authorship, argues against reality, argues against historicity, argues against prophecy, argues against everything that would demonstrate the truthful veracity and errancy of the scriptures. We understand how they deconstruct it. But while that is true, and that is going to be focused on in your OTI and NTAI classes to defeat that as it should be and as it must be and as it is easily done, at the same time, what I would like to focus on here is not the negative contribution of higher criticism, but the positive. And I do not mean positive by commendable. I mean positive of not only what they deconstruct, but what they reconstruct. They're tearing something down to build something else up. They are like HGTV in that way. So what are they building up? What are they building up? We told you what they're tearing down, the supernatural nature of scripture, but what are they building up? They are building up in your mind a different kind of prophet, 
a different kind of biblical writer. You say, what kind of biblical writer are you talking about? Well, with source criticism, they are arguing and waging and trying to influence the mind of individuals to say that, of course, the biblical writers, they did not know scripture because everything that could be a connection is just taken from these other sources behind the scenes. So for a, for a prophet to actually be reading and studying their Bible, that's not historically tenable. That's what source criticism does. And then they would say this, and for a prophet to think down the line and about a bigger picture, about a bigger reality, to speak of bigger issues, well, that's not true because they only had tunnel vision. They were thinking about the here and now, the zitzenleben of what is taking place. That's genre criticism. That's why in genre criticism, everyone is trying to identify, oh, this style means that it must have been a funeral at this time. This style means that David was mourning over a specific situation. This style means that there must be something tied to his historical circumstances because that's the only way they can think. They only think in the here and now. That's it. And then on top of that, you have redaction criticism, which says, yes, sprinkled throughout this are theological ideas. And what does that imply? The prophets aren't theologians. They just sprinkle theology in bits and places of the Old Testament, and the rest is not theological whatsoever. And so the picture is this. You have prophets who don't know their Bible because it never existed, who never speak to a bigger picture or bigger theological ideas, and who mostly don't talk theology at all. And with that, of course, you're going to be wondering, can this person know about the Messiah? Can this person speak about the Messiah? Can this person preach about the Messiah? Can this person talk about the Messiah? Would he even think to do so? Of course, you're going to be asking those questions because you've already been prejudiced against the author. You see, what we must be vigilant against is not only to be wary of adding meaning on top of scripture, but also but the, about the influence of higher criticism to reduce down or diminish the potential and the person and the identity and the characteristic and description of the prophets of the Old Testament and make them less than who they are. Essentially, higher criticism has emaciated the text. Sure, there are some rich parts. That would be what redaction criticism claims. But then you get into genealogy, narratives, certain laws and prophecies, and you don't know what to do with them. And that's why people, when reading the Old Testament, come up with very trite applications. Cain killed Abel. Don't hit your brother. Noah built an ark. You get a boat. <laughs> Moses had a stick. You get a stick. David killed Goliath. You kill all Goliaths and your Goliath, and you're watching people kill Goliath. You, you have all these kinds of applications that are ridiculous. Why? Because no one believes there's theology there to begin with. So if there's no theology there to begin with, then how do you get an application? But why do people believe there's no theology to begin with? Because higher criticism bankrupted it all in the discussion, and evangelicals were taken off guard by not only what they negatively did, but what they positively did in reconstructing the higher critics and of the authors. So what do we do from here? Have you noticed the problem is always about authorial intent? That's what the issue always is. The issue is, are you going to add on to Scripture, or are you going to reduce from scripture. That has been the tension that we've been seeing. And what we've been seeing as well is the question of Christocentric hermeneutic with the addition or trying to add a layer on is, is that real? But with higher criticisms reduction, our question is, is that actually accurate? And is that actually the thickness and the fullness of what the prophets could do? And so what we are looking for in essence is real meaning, one that comes from the Bible, not just your ingenuitive layer on top, but at the same time, we want thick meaning, so to speak. We want the fullness of what the prophets actually can do because they are supernatural and they make claims and descriptions about themselves. So what we need now, having understood the problem, which is everyone's attacking authorial intent, 
is we need to rebuild authorial intent the way the Bible wants you to understand it. And in fact, that's exactly what the Bible articulates. Second Peter 1, in the famous verses about the nature of inspiration, notice what it says. Men being carried by the Spirit, they spoke. Who were speaking in the Scripture? Men spoke. It is their intent, guided supernaturally and perfectly by the Holy Spirit. It is their intent that is sufficient. Even Jesus in supposedly the Christ event where he reinterprets all the scripture, notice what he says in Luke 24. He says these words, oh, you who are foolish and slow to believe. Notice at that moment, he does not say, well, you you, you had no, there was no way for you to get this. I need to unlock the Old Testament for you so that you can get what it's really saying. He didn't say that. The problem has never been with the scripture. The problem has always been with the heart. The scripture has always been clear. The scripture has always been articulated. And notice the rest of Jesus' phrase in Luke 24. Oh, you who are slow to believe what the prophets have spoken. How does our Lord describe the Old Testament? He does not describe it as just some dictation theory that God handed down. Rather, he says this, it is what the prophets have spoken. Spoken, what is the meaning of the Old Testament? What the prophets, the human writers, perfectly inspired, they have spoken. You wanna know the meaning of the scripture? God's intent, man's intent are unified in it. There's concurrence or confluence, however you'd like to describe it. And that is sufficient. That is sufficient because the prophets are theologians and exegetes and therefore They give us the theology, and all we have to do is say what they said. That's it. That's what we do. And so with that, we have identified the problem. We need to believe in the sufficiency of authorial intent. We don't need to add to it, and we certainly don't need to reduce it. But we need to affirm it, and we need to understand it. So let's do that now. And this brings us from the first point to the second point. We've talked about the problem. Now we talk about the prophets. There are three steps in rebuilding the prophets properly. There are three steps in this second point of how to rebuild the prophets properly. Here's step one. Step one is that people, as in the prophets, they can say theological things. It's potentially possible because of the way intent works. So often we talk about, oh, we need to know authorial intent. Oh, we need to know what the authors intended. What do we even mean by authorial intent? And often in our minds, we think authorial intent is information, just data. That's incorrect. That's incorrect. For example, let's say you're playing ball outside, which I I wouldn't do, but let's say you were doing that. Somebody hits a ball and you say the magic words. You say, I Got it, which if you're a grammarian nerd is a little bit weird and actually illustrative of verbal aspect because how can you have something you don't have yet? Are you a prophet? Like what, what's going on there? But in any case, how do you, you say the words I got it and then somebody rams right into you, knocks you over and no one catches the ball and you stand up and you say, did you not hear what I said? And the guy says, I heard exactly what you said. You said three words, I got it. I understood what you said. And you say, "Uh, excuse me, you didn't know what I meant. Because I got it is not just a statement of fact. It's not just data. There's an intent. There's a purpose in you saying it. And the purpose is, I will catch this ball and no one else will. And there is a response, which is this. You can be anywhere in the world. Anywhere, you could fly to China right now. I'm okay with that. As long as you do not be on the very same geographical longitude and latitude that I am about to catch this ball. As long as that's the case, you have understood what I truly intended. Intent is not just data. It's what you say, why you say, and the response to it all entailed in intent. It's the same thing at in and out We go there. And you might say, well, a person says, what would you like? And you say, well, I would like a double-double with animal-style fries and, and uh, you know, Neapolitan shake and everything on the secret menu. And they say, I like that too. <laughs> and you say, excuse me. Oh, no. Double-double, animal-style fries, Neapolitan shake. I understood what you said. 
You say, well, then you didn't understand what I meant because what you're supposed to do now is supposed to type that information into that machine and take my money and give me some food. Intent is not just data. You come home from work, you come home from school, and you tell your wife, honey, I'm home. Does she say, well, that's self-evident? <laughs> it's a fact. You're there. You don't mean it that way. It's obvious that you're home. You have a reason why you're saying what you say in context. And that has a range of responses. And if you think, oh, this is just speech act theory. No, speech act theory is just observing something here in this regard. And really, you should just disregard the whole notion in a sense. But all you need to take away from this, frankly, is that this notion of communication, this isn't just something the moderns made up. This isn't just something modern philosophy has picked up on. No, this is biblical. This goes back to the Bible. This is why God condemns Israel. And Israel says, but we did exactly what you said. But God's condemnation of them is, you didn't do it for the reasons that I said it. So you still disobeyed his intent. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 5, but I say to you, it's not just about if you commit adultery or not. It's about if you have what? Lust. Or if you murder, it's not just about not murdering somebody, but also about if you are what? angry. Why? Because there's a what and there's a why behind the command and a so what. And you are expected not just to do the what, you are expected to do the whole of what is intended. And so with that, here's a reality. And the reality is this, that every text, because it has intent, every text has a what and a why and a so what. Every text has what it's talking about. But there's a reason in context it's talking about that. The author deliberated that. The author had a purpose in that. And we need to understand that too. And that gives rise to theology. And that means every text also has an application because the author wanted you to respond to it in some way, which means every single text in the Bible, every single one has theology. Every single one has application. You cannot just skip over this and say, well, there's not much there. There's always something there. And you need all three. You need all three. You need to know what it says. You need to know why it says it in context. And you need to know the responses that the author has for us. And you do not sell an intent short. You do not do that. And all of this to say, can an author do theology? Of course, because he has intent, which means that he can speak in these ways. The question is, second, does he know how to do that? Does he know how to do that? And the answer is affirmative. Affirmative. Throughout the scripture, you know that the biblical writers, they command us to know our Bibles. Joshua 1, the word of the law should not depart from our mouth. Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 119, 119 particularly, every verse is about God's law. They cared about the word of God. Psalm 63, David says that the law is in his meditation in the night watches. Isaiah 8, if they do not pay attention to the prophets, they have no dawn. 2 Kings 17 condemns Israel for not understanding the law and not living out the law. That was their accountability. Hosea 6 pleads with Israel to come and know Yahweh and to know his word. Ezra 7.10, the leader of Israel, he delights in seeking to study and then live and then teach God's law over and over and over from the historical books, to the wisdom literature, to the prophets, to the Pentateuch, there is an urging to know the word of God. And so you can't have it both ways. You cannot preach a sermon from the Old Testament or the New Testament of how the biblical writers love God's word, know his word, meditate on his word day and night, and then think at the same time they don't. And they don't write that way. And they don't know any theology. And they don't know the scriptures. Which one is it? Is it that they know the and love the scriptures as you're urging your congregation to follow their example? Or is it that they were not that way? Or is it that you really believe they're the biggest hypocrites of all time because they tell you to know the scripture, but they themselves refuse to do so? Which one is it? If we believe that the prophets did what they said, then they know their Bibles. And if they know their Bibles, and they have the ability to speak theology because there's a what, why, so what in scripture, then they can fill in those gaps. And now all we have to prove in this three-step process under this second point is not just that they can, not just that they know how, but that they do. And they really do. They really do. They are theologians par excellence. If you think about the historical books, 
They know the law. David even knew the law. He knew how much retribution cost when he talks to Nathan about his sin with Bathsheba in the parable in 2 Samuel 12. There are the famous, what we call three Gs, three prohibitions about a king, not to multiply gold, gals, and giddy up. Those are horses. And the idea is, you see that in Solomon's life. What did he multiply? In the opening chapters, he multiplied gold. He multiplied horses. And then it all builds up to the final moment when he multiplies what? His wives, the women. And you know the kingdom is over at that point. The authors had a biblical lens. You think about judges and the person of Gideon that says this, that Israel, when Gideon was trying not to become king, but he said this, bring me your earrings, bring me your rings of gold, melt them down. What does that sound like? what they did with the golden calf. They knew their Bible. Psalm 89 in wisdom literature is an exposition of the Davidic covenant. Psalm 2 references the Davidic covenant as well. Psalm 114 with the Egyptian Hallel. You have the Exodus in Proverbs. It uses unique terms related to adultery found in Numbers chapter 5. And Proverbs also talks about binding wisdom to yourself, binding wisdom to your neck, which goes back to the book of Deuteronomy. In the prophets, they reference where David was born in Bethlehem, like in Micah 5 2. They knew their Bibles. Even in Zechariah 9, the prophecy of Jesus riding humbly on a donkey goes back actually in language to Genesis 49, where you actually hear of another prophecy where the Messiah comes in on a donkey. They knew their Bibles. In Daniel 2, it says this, as the rock crushes everything and it's to dust and the mountain that arises, it says this, it fills the earth. You should remember Isaiah chapter 6. What does it say? The glory of God will what? Fill the earth earth. Same language. They knew their Bible. Joel, with his prophecy about locusts, goes back to Deuteronomy. And in Nahum, there's all these allusions back to the book of Isaiah, but one is clear. Nahum says this, behold, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who proclaim good news. That comes straight from Isaiah. Nahum is the near prophecy that guarantees that Isaiah, the long prophecy, will take place. All that to say is these people are not people who just could talk theology, who even knew their Bibles well enough to talk about theology and then fail to do it. They fail to talk and expound upon their Bibles. No, these are people who actually do. They know their Bibles. They talk about their Bibles. They talk about scripture all the time. And that results in certain activities, activities like reflecting upon scripture. The Psalms are full of reflecting upon what God has done. That's worship, that's theology. They also relate passages together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and build out theology from past to present to future. And they even do this, they repeat things. They show things how they repeat And that gets into the issue of typology, which I haven't actually often talked about, but I figure since I want to say some things that are new to the discussion, I would comment briefly on that here. You might wonder, how does typology work? Is it just because I see it? No, you are not an author of scripture. You are a reader. And the biblical writers, they're theologians. They know how to set up for this. And you say, can they really do that? Yes, Mr. Higher Critic, they can. They know how, and they do it. Let me show you some examples. For example, in Genesis chapter 12, we know that Abraham, Abram at the time, he goes down to Egypt, and there are some issues with his wife in that time, in that situation. And likewise, in Genesis 26, you see a parallel with Isaac. The same thing happens with him in a different geographical situation. There is an intentional pattern. There is an intentional parallel that shows Isaac continues Abraham. Or in Exodus chapter 1, it talks about, or Exodus 2 really, it talks about how Moses' mother made him a wicker basket, but actually the Hebrew word there is the word ark, like Noah's ark. Now to be clear, do you really think Moses' mom built Noah's ark and floated it down the Nile to hide him. That's not the best way to go about it on a lot of reasons. But the reason Moses records it that way is so you make a connection between the two. And he even talks about how that river was full of reeds, suf, like the Yam Suf of the Red Sea later on. There is a connection from past to present to future written not by us, made up not by us, but made up and established under inspiration by the biblical writers. They did that. 
In Samuel, David's wilderness wandering touches the very same geographical locations as Israel's wilderness wandering. That's no accident. And later on, Micah says that that's what's going to happen to the Messiah because that because the Davidic dynasty will go in Micah 1.15 back to Adullam and start where David began. There are connections here that are forming. And to be clear, not all of the ones that I mentioned, they're not all about Christ. And that's the point. Here's the problem. Sometimes in trying to find Christ where he's not, you miss him where he is and you miss a greater theology that would magnify him. We need to say what the author said because they can. They do do theology in and of themselves. And by following them, that brings the greatest honor to Christ. And that brings us full circle. Here's what we know. We know the Old Testament is rich. Why? Because the writers of scripture, they can speak theology They know how because they're rich with scripture and they do, they do. And they are the ones who do so, not us. You and I do not improve on the Old Testament. You and I do not enrich the Old Testament or any part of scripture. This is all sufficient. What they have said is rich entirely because under inspiration, they wrote it and it's filled with theology. Every part of it is. Our job is to know that confidently and to say what they have said. There are implications of this. One is people ask, well, in typology, do you read only the types established by Scripture or or do you read your own? Again, you are not an author of Scripture. You cannot read your own types. That's ludicrous. However, what we always remember is the biblical writers have their own ways of making connections. You follow those. You follow those carefully and identify those carefully and you say those because they said it. It's like Simon says, what they say, you say. And on a broader nature, we need to have confidence every time we open our Bible that the Old Testament as well as the New Testament are full of theological riches and that's why we do what we do. Well, that's the problem. There are the prophets and here's their messianic proclamation. What we can see from all of this is that the prophets can, and they do speak theology, and specifically, they speak the theology about the Messiah. And we see that. We see that in four ways. And I'll say each one in 10 seconds. Just kidding. But let's talk about these a little bit. Think about this with me. You know Genesis 3.15. It's messianic in nature. It talks about an individual. He's eschatological because things build up to him. He's even paralleled with Satan himself as opposed to the seed of the serpent. So you know this is a climactic person and he's also victorious. But think about the language of Genesis 3.15 carried out throughout scripture. For example, in Numbers 24, people wonder, are we sure that, that the star that rises out is going to be Messiah? That How do we know that Moses or whoever was talking about this talked about it? Well, it's because in that situation, notice the language of what Balaam says. He says this, he says The star will come out and will crush the head. Did you hear that language? Crush the head. That goes back to Genesis 3.15. It's immersed, it's tied back to the Messiah. In essence, Moses writing, saying, hey, what I'm talking about as I report Balaam's words is what I was earlier talking about in Genesis 3.15. You know this is messianic. Psalm 68 happens the same way. In Psalm 110, it is the same way. Good job, LSB, for translating this properly. It says this, instead of like killing the chief men over the world or something like that, it says, he crushes the head over the earth. That's what the text says. And it says it awkwardly on purpose. So you would make the connection back to Genesis 3.15 and say, what is David talking about here? He's talking about what Moses was talking about in Genesis 3.15. That same thing goes into Psalm 72. The same thing goes into Habakkuk chapter three. The same thing happens with the grammar of seed found in Genesis chapter 22, 17 through 18, Psalm 72, 2 Samuel 7, and which ultimately goes to Galatians 3, 16. The same thing in Psalm two, having been anchored back to the Davidic covenant, establishes some other terminology. In Psalm two, it says that the Messiah will reign to the ends of the earth. Why does that matter? Because now that will be carried consistently through the Old Testament. Psalm 22, it's anchored in, it talks about the Messiah receiving the ends of the earth. Psalm 40, Isaiah 49 talks about the ends of the earth. And guess what Jesus says in Acts 1? You should go to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. 
Everything is consistently carried out. Why? Because that's a messianic term. That's a messianic phrase. That's a messianic description. And they deliberately anchored themselves in those things. Prophecy is deliberately messianic and they went out of their way to show you by anchoring it in messianic imagery. That's direct prophecy. Here's a second way that the Messiah is in the Old Testament, by participation. We know this with the angel of Yahweh as well as the word of Yahweh. It's also there indirectly. That's the third way indirectly on an individual level. We talked about how Moses is setting up for things. Well, that's true. We even know that David's life sets up for things. Hosea 3, 5 typifies Jesus as the new David explicitly. And we know that David's birthplace matters because Micah picks up on this. We know that David's wilderness wandering matters because Micah also picks up on this and it's picked up in the New Testament. And we even know the way David conquered Jerusalem matters because when David conquers Jerusalem, he says in kind of a mocking way that the blind and the lame will never be able to attack him. And Matthew intentionally says in Matthew 21 in the triumphal entry that when Jesus enters Jerusalem, he heals all the blind and the lame. That's on purpose to show that Jesus is the true fulfillment of David. And in all these instances, of individual connections. There's a theology that develops and sometime in progressive revelation, it is connected, whether that be in Old Testament or in New Testament to Christ, follow those connections. It's not us making things up. It is the way the Bible itself makes those connections and it is completely within the original intent as it's building. And in fact, in proper expository preaching and in proper biblical theology, this is not rewriting those original theologies. No, the Bible's assuming you have mastered and so thoroughly understood the richness of that original theology so that it can add on and enhance your understanding of Christ. That's the point. You don't reread and just say, well, this is about Christ and we don't need to remember or understand these theologies of this text originally as it was originally articulated. No, it's the opposite. You need to know all the theology there so that you can really understand better the theology of Christ as it comes up. It assumes you understand these things. On top of that kind of indirect connectivity of building a theology that the Bible eventually relates to Christ, there is also another kind of indirect preparation, which is the flow of the storyline. In Psalm 78, the history of Israel is recounted, ending with David. There's a push to the Davidic dynasty. In 1 Kings 8, it is similarly recounted. We could talk about the Toledot structure. We could talk about Judges and Ruth. The very last word of Ruth is the word David, showing the movement of history to 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. And like the book of 1 and 2 Kings is titled, it's all about the kings. There is this push to knowing that redemptive history moves to the kings. And by tracing that, we also honor Christ. We also honor Christ. And there are four ways there. Prophecy, participation, indirect preparation on an individual connectivity level, indirect preparation relative to the storyline. They're all there. And there's many, many more of the Old Testament. If we were talking about Job 19 and Job 33 or Amos chapter 9 or Hosea with the new Exodus or Nahum contrasting a vile counselor with the wonderful counselor or in Haggai or Ezekiel or in Zechariah or in Malachi and the list goes on and on. And all of these Things, whether they be prophecies or participation or preparation on a micro or macro level, all of them, though, are controlled by the text. It isn't because we made them up. You don't see your own connections. You don't make your own roads to the New Testament in Christ. They do. They do all the work, and you follow them, and we have the confidence that by saying what they said and making sure we've done all our homework to know how thoroughly they've said it, we have honored Christ and we will amplify him far more than anything we could have imagined. Put it this way, in the end, what we have is a very full theology. Every line, every word that talks about theological themes and theological doctrines and theological categories, so much our minds cannot attain. And we know that the prophets under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they, by their own intertextuality, wove all of that together in very particular ways that honor Christ. If you really want to be Christocentric, you give your people the full theology, the full theology that honors and surrounds him. Then you're truly Christocentric. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, 
Help us as we go to our study to honor you in the means and the end. Help us to understand and have the highest view of your word. That the biblical writers are not just these simpletons who write down moral lessons with very trite applications, but there are people who love your word and write about your word under inspiration and expound upon it. And our job is to follow what they have thought and said, knowing how deep it is. And they have written intentionally because they have cared about these issues, even about the Messiah. Help us to say what they said and thereby to have a complete picture, the complete ramifications, the complete theology of which Christ is at the center hub so that your son is honored with the full weight of what he has revealed and done and honored by the full weight of how this word shapes our lives and our people's lives to honor the son of God in whose name we pray, amen.